get some of your attention. So uh, today I will uh, present SetFoam, which is a solver for a uh, two-fluid model for sediment transport and particulate flows in geophysics. There is a whole bunch of people there, and I will uh, show you the picture at the end so that you can see their face. There is a, a couple of people. And I will start with some motivations. Okay. So here is why we want to understand sediment transport. When you have uh, major floats, which is uh, rising uh, more and more frequently, it can generate strong erosion in rivers. Or if you look at coasts, you can also see a strong erosion, which we have to take care of as uh, engineers. Another problem is when you put a hydraulic structure in the flow that interact with the sediment bed, and at some point you have this scow pit that is generated by the flow. This is something you want to avoid. And the goal of the model is to try to understand those processes and to mitigate it. A bit of history. Uh, we started from the two-phase Euler foam of uh, Enric Brischer from Open Foam 2.1, I think, that was uh, published in 2002. And the first PhD student uh, started in 2011, was uh, Zen Cheng. He was a PhD at the University of Delaware under the supervision of uh, Tom Shu. And I entered the game, or we entered the game. Uh, I am working at uh, Legi in Grenoble in 2014, where we started to collaborate on the development of the model. And we are now in uh, 2022 at the version 3.3. Uh, the model is available on GitHub. So if you are interested, you can uh, go there. There is a documentation, so we try to do it uh, correctly. And I will show you how we derive the model so you understand the basic concepts. So the idea is to see the solid phase as a continuum as well as the fluid. So we start from the local mass and momentum conservation equation. We apply a local spatial averaging. There is different method, but here I show a local spatial averaging. We define a fluid phase averaging operator, which looks like that in terms of uh, graphical uh, understanding. In this circle, we integrate only over the fluid phase. So it, it introduces some filter, which is called G, which is nothing but something that looks like a sphere in 3D, or it could be Gaussian. It has to be uh, normalized, that's it. So if you apply this operator to the equations by doing quite a bit of math, you end up with uh, ma mass conservation for the fluid phase where epsilon is the volume of fluid and a momentum conservation for the fluid phase, which if you remove this NF term is Navier-Stokes. And NF corresponds to the transfer of momentum with the solid phase. We can do the same game for the solid phase by this time averaging only over the particle phase. And we obtain very similar equations where phi is the volume fraction of sediments or particles. And you see the plus NF term. So these two terms cancel that if you sum the equations. So NF is really the transfer from one phase to the other, back and forth. OK, so these are the equations that we have to solve. Uh, because we applied an averaging, we filtered out the grain scale physics in the problem. And we have to plug it back through closure relationship. We forget about turbulence at the beginning, so here is what we need to do. We need to provide granular stress model that represent particle-particle interactions. We need to provide a uh, model for fluid-particle interactions. And we need to account for the presence of the particles on uh, the fluid shear stress. So th this is what we need to do. For the fluid-particle forces in a Laminar flow, the first one you need to do, you need to add, is uh, Archimedes buoyancy force. So we introduce that in the model, like minus phi grad P. And if the particles have very small inertia, you can assume that the drag force is only uh, Stokes drag. So this is the easiest uh, possible solution that you can think of. If there is multiple particles, then you have an hindrance function that you need to add that represent uh, the crowdiness of the particles uh, effect on the drag. So these are very basic uh, informations. And these are almost the only closure that you need to perform 
the first test case that I want to show you, which is a pure sedimentation problem. So you take an initial sample of uh, sphere, here is polystyrene beads, you steer the system in a very, uh, lami la very uh, viscous fluid, here is silicon oil, 200 times viscosity of water, and if you steer it uh, efficiently, you can get to any concentration you want. Here we start at 48%, and we know the packed concentration is about 60%. So we want to replicate an experiment that has been performed in France uh, by this guy. He has been using MRI system to measure concentration profile in course of time. Modeling gradients. So as I told you, I will take just a drag force, Stokes drag plus endurance function. And the other parameter I need to take care of is the particle pressure. So compressive force that prevents the particles from getting to crazy uh, concentration. And for that, we use Johnson and Jackson model. So the pressure is a bulk modulus times this function of phi. Phi RLP is a random loose packing, let's say for sphere 57%. So this is a concentration above which you start to have a contact network and normal stresses starts to develop. You have a phi max that need also to be set to say when this function will diverge. Graphical representation. This function looks like that, zero below 57, and divergence at 63 point something percent. So the goal is to perform this configuration with a model I showed you. In terms of parameters, we have like 0.3 millimeter grid resolution for six centimeter height. We have a time step, which is 0.2 second, which gives a CFL number on the relative velocity of order 0.1, and you need to respect something on the CFL for the relative velocity if you don't want the code to blow up. Numerical scheme is super easy, simple. First order, you learn time, upwind in for uh, advection. Oh. Here's the setup. So we start with this hyperbolic tangent concentration profile. The black lines corresponds to measurements. So we start from this one and we end up at this one. On the left, you have the setting curves. So this corresponds to the upper interface. At the bottom, the sediment will accumulate and generate a second uh, interface, which is going up, which we will track there. So the points are the experiments. And if I play the movie, you see this front is forming, going up. This one is going down slowly. You see on the setting curves, the two interfaces match pretty well. The difference can be explained by the endurance function that we, can, that we can fine tune. And at the end, what is very important is to be able to predict this stable situation, which is the first situation you need to do if you want to look at sediment transport, is to have a deposited bed of particles with a reasonable prediction of particle pressure. And this is what we have. When the bed has settled, what you expect is to have a linear particle pressure, a granulostatic distribution of pressure. And why do we need that? Because if you are interested in the rheology of the granular flow, we know at some point it's frictional at the yield, at the yield position. And this rheology is proportional to the particle pressure. So if you don't have the right particle pressure, you can do whatever you want. You'll never get a, a good model. So I replay the movie quickly. The other part, which is interesting, if you look at the momentum budget there, you see that there is a balance between excess pore pressure and particle pressure, which you see here, the blue curve represents the excess pore pressure that slowly dissipates in time at the particles uh, deposit and the weight of the, bu the buoyant weight of the particles is taken care of by the particle pressure. So this, this is an easy problem. Not that easy, but quite simple. Now, what happens if I impose a pressure gradient? So if I impose a pressure gradient, I drive a flow above my bed, which is here. And if it's laminar, then it's just a quasi flow that will drag the particles in the bed to make them move. This experiment has been done with two millimeter PMMA particles, so quite a low density ratio. The fluid is Triton X100. You don't know what it is, but it's about 200 times uh, the viscosity of water, which makes a Reynolds number or the one. So it's pretty cool because there is no turbulence. And the other cool aspect is that if you take Einstein viscosity for the fluid phase and a Coulomb friction rheology, so mu equal constant, you end up with an analytical solution, which is a parabolic velocity profile 
from the real position to the surface. So let's see if we can do that with a model. First, I need to implement the granular rheology in my model. The Coulomb model is tau p equal mu s p p. So I got the good p p now, I know that. Mu s is Kenston. I make this expression tensorial like this. So I assume that the particle stress is aligned with the Reynolds, with the velocity shared tensor. And if I do that, I can isolate a viscosity for the particle phase. This is great, but if SP, the velocity shared tensor, magnitude is going to zero, I have a problem, it goes to infinity, so I have to regularize it. And we did a, a, a bit of work with uh, Mark Medal uh, on this problem, and we ended up with this proposition, which uh, comes from uh, Bingham fluids. It's a polynomial expression that works quite well for Coulomb or dense coronal flow rheologies. So we did that for mu of i and mu of i v. Here is the easy uh, mu s equal constant problem. Okay, so I start from my sedimented bed, which is here. This is a concentration, and I apply a pressure gradient. And what I see here on the velocity is a quasi flow, truncated quasi flow. The bed interface is here, and inside, I do predict a parabolic profile, which is exactly what the analytical solution in black tells you. There are some differences because here the concentration is not a perfect step, but the agreement is good enough for us to move forward and add more complexity to the problem. So now, on the left, you have the movie with the laminar flow. Here, you have sort of the same particles, three millimeter in size, same density ratio, but the Reynolds number is five order of magnitudes larger than on the left. And when you look at the movie, you see common things. Here, you have a dense regime where particles interact with each other, so there is frictional interactions, maybe some collisions. But if you look above, you see particles that are transported away from the bed by uh, turbulent eddies. So this is the complexities that we need to model now if we want to reproduce sediment transport in the real world. So let's look at that. Uh, back in 2014, I supervised the experimental work in a 10 meter flume. So we use these three millimeter particles. And I work with a colleague who is developing an acoustic concentration and velocity profiler, which allows to measure velocity and concentration at quite high frequency and resolution. And based on this movie here, we could get velocity profiles, concentration, and Reynolds shear stress, TKE, and so on. So this is a benchmark for the model, and I will try to replicate that with a two-fluid approach. So I'm sorry for the equations because I have to transfer from Keynote to PPT, and the equations are, or the variables are not that great, but this tilde represents five averaged uh, variables. So when you look at compressible flows, it's good to use this approach because it uh, isolates velocity fluctuations from uh, concentration fluctuations. So if I do that, I still have my drag and buoyancy force. I still have viscous effects, which are negligible when you are at 10 to the power 5 Reynolds number. And the new thing I need to take care of are the Reynolds stresses. And I have one on uh, both phases. The other thing is, now I have fluctuations. So I also need to do something about the granular stresses. And here, we suggest to use a kinetic theory of granular flows instead of a dense granular flow rheology. Turbulence models, so we can isolate the TKE, and we use a simple uh, Boussinesque approximation for the Reynolds stress or the separate stress. Uh, and if you look at the K omega model, this part is the same as for a single phase model. But as you have drag term in the momentum, you also have a drag term in the TKE equation. So this term represents the turbulent drag work, which measure with the alpha here, which measure the degree of correlation of the fluctuations between the particle and the fluid. If they are highly correlated, there is no transfer of TKE from the fluid to the particles. But if they are not correlated, this, this term becomes a sink, and you have dissipation through the drag force. The other term, which is this one, corresponds to density stratification and uh, buoyancy destruction of, of TKE. 
Another approach is simply to try to resolve as much as possible the flow scales, and we also use dynamic Lagrangian model, where we have uh, this kind of more formula, local formula for subgrid uh, viscosity, where C as a Smagorinsky coefficient is not a coefficient, it's calculated through a dynamic procedure. For the kinetic theory of granular flows, it's an analogy with molecular gases, but the difference is that the dissipation of energy is not due to viscosity, it's due to collisional interactions between the grain. And these collisional interactions are somehow controlled by the restitution coefficient, which is a loss of momentum at collision. If you look at the closures there, you see that they all depend on this granular temperature, so you need to have access to this quantity, and for that, we add a transport equation, which is very similar to the TKE equation for a fluid phase. Here you have the production of uh, uh, granular temperature by the mean flow, dissi diffusion, dissipation, and here a transfer term between the fluid and the solid. And this part is important. You have to have uh, a variable that can uh, receive the agitation of the fluid TKE for the grains. So let's um, have a look at the validation of this problem. So I go back to my experiments. I try to perform a simulation. The domain is uh, something like 80 centimeter long, 40 centimeter wide, like the flume I have. The domain is made of 30 million cells, and we had to go down to a resolution which is about particle diameter divided by two in the x, y direction, and a bit smaller in the wall normal direction because you have to resolve the gradients of the mean field. I run the simulation. Oh. So in the plane of symmetry, you see the velocity, instantaneous velocity field. So you see that we do resolve turbulent current structures. And if you look at the gray color, it represents isocontour of concentration. And you do see on the top interface here, which corresponds to 8% concentration, the imprint of the turbulent current structures on the dynamic of the sediments. So this is great, the movie looks good, but is it quantitative? Indeed, yes. If you look at the velocity, the concentration, the Reynolds shear stress, and the TKE, the, ma the matching is pretty good. Even for the concentration in log scale, you see that even very far away from the bed, we can actually predict pretty well the turbulent suspension. And there is no tuning parameter. I say almost because one thing I didn't mention, we have a model for uh, the unresolved part uh, of the drag force, which is, which is called the drift velocity, and we had to add this term to get very good results. If we don't turn this on, it's okay, but it's not as good as this one. Okay, so we have the LES results. We also want to be able to do run simulation. So now I show a 1D simulation. So just to give you an idea, uh, the LES is about one month on a couple hundred CPUs. The 1D simulation is one hour on my laptop, so there is some advantage at doing run simulation. The first one is a comparison of uh, K-epsilon model with kinetic theory. This is a dashed line. And overall, it's doing a decent job. We have some problem in the very dense layer here, uh, but we can predict the dilute suspension quite, quite okay. If we use uh, dense granular flow rheology with the same K-epsilon model, the dense part is quite good, but if you look at the suspension, it's not that great. So there is something missing when we have this uh, dense granular flow rheology. So I don't want to enter into all the details of the pro and the cons of this type of approach. The point is to show you that with this type of approach, we are able to predict sediment transport driven by a unidirectional flow. And as we are here now, we can move on to the next step, which is to look at more complicated situations. And the situation I want to highlight here, we'll stop the movie and talk. We start from a slightly undulated bed, and we drive an oscillatory flow. The bed is 440 micron sand particles. We drive the flow with a pressure gradient. The velocity, orbital velocity is 0.5 meter per second, and the period is five seconds. At the beginning, you see some very small scale bed features that appear that are uh, small-scale repos. When the repos become well-developed, 
we start to see intense vortex shedding going on back and forth, which is a mechanism that gives rise to the bad instability of the orbital ripples. And if you wait long enough, you see this ripple is uh, bulging on the side of this one. This one is kind of slowly disappearing, and it will end up uh, merging with one of the two ripples on the side. And at the very end, we have three ripples. If we compare the wavelengths that we predict for the six centimeter, and we compare it with empirical ripple predictors from uh, Viberg and Aris or Nielsen, they are on the good order of magnitude for this wave condition and this type of sound. So it's pretty encouraging. And here I just show a space time diagram of the evolution where you see the ripple that is forming and you see the small scale ripples that uh, split from the big one, go in the middle, and then at some point disappear. So we can do that with a K-epsilon model and a kinetic theory model. Now we can also look at uh, the scale phenomena. So I showed you the movie. I put a cylinder there and I impose a flow condition. It will dig a sediment hole around the structure. So back in 2020, we published this paper. This is a configuration that we use. Uh, the mesh is 5 million cells. To run for 600 seconds of dynamics, it took about 20 days on 200 uh, CPUs. So it's a very intense uh, simulation, at least for us. I run it. So here is uh, also a K-omega model and mu i rheology. So the flow is from left to right. The stream traces represent the, uh, the stream trace. You see a horseshoe vortex here with the necklace vortices. At the back, you see vortex shedding going on. Here, you have a very nice rounded shaped scow hole, like here. At the back, the shape is different. We should not see these ridges, and we believe this is due to turbulence modeling, which is not very good to predict uh, the wake of the cylinder. So right now, we are trying to rerun this with larger dissimulation, but at least we demonstrated that for an uh, engineering problem, which is at the lab scale, but quite uh, high Reynolds number, we are able to predict reasonable agreement with uh, experiments. So it could become an engineering uh, tool in hydraulic in the future. Last example, uh, so this is an Antoine Mathieu PhD. We moved to two fluid larger simulation and we want to understand sediment transport uh, driven by waves. So here we have experiments from uh, O'Donoghue on the right, uh, symmetric waves, so the wave is sinusoidal. You see here the free stream velocity. The orbital velocity is 1.5 meter per second. The period is five seconds. Here you have medium sand, fine sand. The gold color corresponds to 57% isoconcentration. The silver is 30%. And the one at the top is 0.5%. Uh, so this is the transition from dilute to intermediate and from um, intermediate to no motion. If I run the movie, we see that they are very different. At the crest, everything is set into motion. During the flow reversal, the medium sand deposit, while the fine sand remains suspended. The only difference in these two simulations is the size of the grains. So there is something going on that explains why we have this difference uh, of behavior. And it has been striking coastal engineers for decades to understand that. Using LES, we are able to explain what's going on. Just to show the capabilities, we have here a comparison of concentration profile at different wave phases for medium sand and fine sand. And you, you see that in the experiments, they indeed observe this kind of flat concentration profile. And the explanation is the following. With fine sand, there is so much sand that is set in suspension that density stratification kills turbulence. So you have a full damping. Then the flow becomes laminar no more turbulence. Then the sediments wants to settle back to the bed, but it's a nonlinear process due to end up settling, and it generates a very sharp interface at this, in this area. And this interface, at this interface, you have shear instabilities, like kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, then, then remix the whole thing. So that's the explanation behind this difference. 
Okay, so it takes me to my uh, conclusions. I think the major improvement that we did for open foam community is the implementation of the granular flow rheology using a regularization technique. So if you're interested in that, you can go in the code and uh, pick what we did. We're also working on improved kinetic theory by adding friction. Uh, we have validated quite extensively the two-phase flow turbulence models, including a larger dissimulation. We also have developed a post-processing package, which is called Fluid Foam. There is a poster in the main hall, so if you're interested, uh, go and stop by. I think that there could be uh, interesting stuff there for everybody. Uh, we have a whole range of applications that we are working on currently. Uh, there is a talk in the parallel session right now by uh, Edward Pigmontella in the FSI on solid mechanics on uh, solid object motion. In, uh, so we drag a cylinder in a, in a sand bed which is quite fun, and we are also working on uh, turbidity currents in uh, avalanches. Okay, so this is all the people who are involved in the development of the model, and I really want to uh, uh, thank the open foam community for making their work open source, because uh, without open foam, I don't think we could have been uh, that far in a so short uh, period of time. And with that, I leave you with this citation. You can discuss if you like uh, after, after my conference. Thank you. So here I have access, it seems, to the chat, but I don't see any question. Is this working? Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm working about uh, on um, evaporators in uh, cooling cycles, uh, and uh, your work reminded me the phenomenon of the entrainment of droplets uh, from um, in annular flow from the liquid film into the vapor score. Do you think that your method can be applied to this kind of problem? Thank you. <coughs> Uh, you mean, uh, is there, if there is no uh, phase transition or no phase change, wh why not? <laughs> uh, the bubbles should be monodispersed too. But yes, I guess the process is probably quite similar of uh, untrainment from a, from a wall to a core flow. Uh, uh, I have a question. How do you treat um, the particles and wall interaction and also fine particles to, uh, to the core, uh, big particles interactions? Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I got your point. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so I have only one size. No, so one, yeah, only one, okay. Yeah, because um, there is a fine sense in the, the uh, yeah, but okay. these are two different si simulations. Ah, okay, so in okay. one case, I have medium sun, and in the other one, I have fine sun. Yeah. But and I keep monodispersed. Yeah, so then the other question is, uh, how do you treat the particles of wall interaction? Uh, what kind of closures you do? For particle fluid interactions? Pa particle wall. Particle wall. Ha, in, the, in this one, there is no wall. That's the good thing, that the beauty of sediment transport. Here is a deposited bed. So they don't, they interact with the bed. Uh, so also the other uh, previous simulations? Yeah, I, uh, okay. almost all the time I have a fixed bed oh, okay. at the base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. And then what controls what's going on there is friction. I think the previous question was addressing, for example, the bridge pier scour where the particles are interacting with a bridge pier, for example. Okay. Yeah, I think it's second order, but uh, I cannot be sure, of course. Okay, uh, yeah. first, thank you for the tremendous amount of work that you actually put into this. It's, yeah, even looking in, in the codes is impressive. 
But I have a question about, yeah, the kinetic theory, up to my understanding, is derived for spherical particles. Uh, do, do, do you have uh, experience with calibrating the set form for simulation comprising strongly non-spherical particles? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, what, what we did, and it's a part that I didn't show, but we are working on a sort of CFDDM simulations with spheres. Uh, we model non-sphericity through uh, f the friction coefficient between the particles. So we say that uh, at first order, let's say, a non-spherical particle exhibit a much larger uh, friction at contact. Okay. We go from 0.4 to 0.7. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm asking just because we, are, yeah, we have a project where we are trying to use uh, like low-scale low CFDDM simulations to calibrate that foam for non spherical particles, and we wouldn't like to do anything that is already done. <laughs> so. Yeah, but what, what we did, and we are trying to publish that right now, is uh, we performed a unidirectional flow, okay, so simple, a boundary layer that drives, simple, a boundary layer that drives a sediment transport using discrete element method. And you know that kinetic theory only represent binary collisions. So when you enter into the dense part, you also need to add a frictional component. And it's done by chemical engineers for decades, but they use a very simple Coulomb model, which is probably, which is not enough to capture the, the experimental uh, results that we, that we see. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. There is no other question. I think we can thank our speaker, Julien Chacha. Thank you. Next speaker. Is Virginia Rossi, is this online or? No, physical, thank you. So, good afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be here today to present uh, our project that is uh, the analysis and the improvement of the discharge capacity of the flood control system of Malvalia Dam. So, uh, before I start, I just would like to spend a few words to present who we are in order that you can understand in which field we work. So uh, the company is named Laboratorium 3D and uh, we work in the field of river engineering, hydraulics and protection against natural hazard. We born in uh, 2019 in the southern part of Switzerland and we um, do physical and numerical model uh, we actually are five owner and three collaborator. In our laboratory, we have uh, two tilting flume and some more space to build a model with a particular morphology. We are equipped with uh, a um, closed hydraulic uh, system with the pumps uh, with a maximum of uh, 260 liter per second. So here are an example of uh, one of our project. Here there is a project of uh, river stabilization through block ramps. In the first figure, you can see the physical model in a scale one to 30, in which we study the configuration and the density of the block for define which is the best in terms of river stabilization. Then, thanks to photogrammetry, we build the riverbed in 3D numerical mode and we rescale to the prototype scale. In this way, we can see um, if there is corridor in terms for, uh, of uh, fish migration. This is another example, so we are now trying to uh, do some research in debris flow. That means that uh, 
we study uh, which flow and up to which scale we can model uh, debris flow. Okay, now let's focus on uh, the project of the control system of Malvalia Dam. Um, the dam is located in the southern part of Switzerland. It's an arch gravity of uh, 192 meters height. And the main structure for diverting the surplus of water is uh, the morning glory spillway. Some feature of the float control system. So we have uh, um, the morning glory spillway, two bottom outlet, uh, call it the new one and the old one, uh, both equipped with an air vent and a drainage tunnel also equipped uh, with an air vent. Um, all these converge in the same pipe. So, the main goal is to define the discharge capacity of the float system. Um, according to the plant manager, the lower part of the pipe, where all, all the tunnel converge, it's supposed to be the weak point of the system. For this reason, we uh, have done three simulations with different inflow configuration, and the same three uh, simulations are done for a tested situation where the pipe, um, the lower part of the pipe is um, coated with uh, concrete in order to decrease the roughness. This because the upper part, so the two bottom outlet, the morning glory spillway and the drainage tunnel are, are already uh, coated with uh, concrete, as you can see in the picture, while the lower part is covered in rock. So we have a roughness of uh, 20 centimeter. So the geometry has uh, constructed with Blender um, through the technical plan and on-site inspection. And the mesh was reconstructed using Snappy X mesh with three levels of uh, refinement. This, this result in uh, mesh resolution between 0 0.1 and 0 0.6 meter. And the entire mesh uh, has approximately 1.5 million cells. So the boundary, we have three inlet patch for water, so the lake, and the two bottom outlet, and also three patch for air, the atmosphere, and the two air vent. And at the end of the pipe, we have the outlet. Some detail about the numerical configuration. We have a Two-phase flow solved with the interform, uh, that means that we use volume of fluid. Both phases are uh, assumed to be incompressible, <coughs> Newtonian and immiscible. Flow is governed by the steady state incompressible form of uh, Rand's formulation. And we close the equation with the Ka-omega SSD model. Uh, as you can see in the table, uh, the gradient and Laplacian term are discretized uh, using Gauss integration with linear interpolation. Velocity k and omega are discretized using upwind scheme. An overview on the boundary condition. So we use uh, uniform inlet velocity for patch where water come in. And for the walls of the system, we use a wall function for k, omega, and nu tilde. So uh, before presenting you the result, I show you some comparison with field data because uh, the labor laboratory uh, of uh, the Technical University of Zurich done some measurement in the old, in the new bottom outlet of the system. So they measure the air demand uh, with a water flow of uh, five cubic meter per second. So we 
under the same condition for our simulation and we compare the result in, uh, in the air demand and also in the pressure drop. We, the comparison in the measurement are considered good. So um, we continue with uh, our analysis. The three simulation performed are this one, the first one with only the morning glory spillway active, the second one with only the morning glory spillway and the new bottom outlet at its maximum capacity of uh, 50 meter cubic, cubic meter per second, and the third one with both auto bottom out outlet open and of course the morning glory spillway. There is uh, the hydrograph that we use uh, for the inlet water for the lake. So we study uh, water flow from 250 and 400 cubic meter per second. So here there is the result for the first simulation. So where only the morning glory spillway is active. We can see that uh, all the flow can be evacuated. Um, and we also observe in the graph uh, at the bottom left, uh, some oscillation in the air vent of the old bottom outlet which is the same uh, observation that we do for the water flow in the tunnel of the bottom outlet. The same observation has been done uh, for the second simulation with also the new bottom outlet open. So the system is able to evacuate almost all the flow and we still observe uh, this uh, oscillation in the air and flow, uh, water flow. The third simulation with uh, both bottom outlet open uh, is different, of course. Now you, we can see the limit of the system. This means that uh, the morning glory spillway reduces capacity. Now we compare the three simulation. Um, in the graph, uh, in the upper part, you can see the typical rating curve, discharge rating curve of a morning glory spillway. And uh, in the left, you can see the measured water in the pipe uh, under the morning glory spillway. At, at the right side, the total flow uh, of the system. So here we can define that the best situation it is the one of the, with, the, with both bottom outlet open and uh, the discharge capacity is 460 cubic meter per second. After that, the water level of the lake start to be affected. So that means that the water um, go above the dam. So here we compare the current situation with the tested situation where we decrease the roughness of the lower part of the pipe and for the second and the third simulation, we see uh, an, increasing, an increase in the uh, discharge capacity, while in the first one, we observe a, a decrease. This was not expected, so we are now, now trying to understand why there is um, this behavior. And so I, I go to the conclusion. So thanks to uh, open foam simulation, we define the discharge capacity of the float control system of Malvalia Dam. So the maximum capacity, which doesn't affect the lake water level, 
is uh, obtained with both bottom outlet open and correspond to approximately 460 cubic meters per second. We also investigate uh, on a roughness, roughness, uh, roughness decrease in the lower part of the pipe, and we see that for two inflow configurations, there is an increase of the discharge capacity. About the outlook, we are now investigating in the reason why we observe the decrease in the discharge capacity in the tested simulation. This means that we have to analyze the head loss in the current situation and in the tested situation, and also investigate in the effect of the oscillation observed in the current situation and also investigate to the flow stabilization effect in the um, decrease in the roughness. Moreover, we want to evaluate if a new ventilation system in the morning glory spillway can increase the discharge capacity. So let me thank the plant manager for allowing us to present here today and the hydraulic department of uh, the Technical University of Zurich uh, for sharing the result of, the, of their me measurement with us. So uh, thank you for your attention. I put my email in case you have uh, some, some question or you want to visit us in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any questions in the attendance? I have maybe also to check if we have questions on the chat. Thank you. You said uh, the tested situation, the results are not expected, but you have a smoother pipe. So I expect to have a higher discharge, which I think you have, no? The, the green one. The yeah. discharge is larger, so if the pipe is smoother, I expect uh, the flow should increase, no? We expect that in the tested situation, the discharge increase. In the first situation. Yeah, sorry. I have one question here, but I think it was a missed question for the last talk. Uh, <laughs> I checked and that didn't reject. Okay. So, uh, so do we have, uh, maybe I will ask you the question afterwards if there is uh, any other question for Virginia. Okay. No, you don't have any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the missed question for you, Julien Chauchard, is uh, thank you for your interesting presentation by uh, Mosba Ben Said. I'm just wondering if it's possible to use your model to simulate sense transport by wind. Huh. Uh, it could be. I know some people in Paris use the same equations for aeolian transport. Then in aeolian transport, the, the problem is that the, the bed load, the part that is transported very near the bed, is a lot uh, impacted by uh, splashing and saltation. Mm -hmm. So you have a coupling between saltating grains and their impact on the sun, which it's tricky to model in a continuum approach. Okay. Thanks. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Dr. Tui. That's it. Thank you.
I was going to talk about primary breakup modeling in metal milk uh, gas optimization. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to my, uh, my talk, also especially welcome to the audience uh, online. Um, so my name is Dennis Tai, and um, today I will be uh, sharing with you uh, a little bit on uh, my research of, uh, on primary breakup modeling in metal melt uh, gas atomization. So I'm a first year PhD student at the Power and Flow Group uh, at the Eindhoven University of Technology. So today I will share with you uh, basically the first steps towards modeling this uh, primary gas atomization. Um, I'll start with a little bit of research background. Um, then I'll go into a bit more detail on uh, what is actually primary atomization and what are the challenges that we are facing there. Um, and the main thing that I want to talk about today is um, how we can create a suitable mesh to uh, perform these simulations. Um, finally, I want to share a little bit on the data collection uh, that I intend to do. And then um, I'll end with a bit of an outlook on how to proceed with uh, this type of modeling. Um, so first I'll give you a bit of a research background. Uh, why do we uh, actually have any interest in uh, gas atomization? Um, so, well, as we all know, uh, additive manufacturing is, is quite up a, uh, an, or quite a, a new technique that is getting very popular very fast. Um, and that will allow us to uh, basically introduce a sort of circular economy where we can print products, use them, um, at some point they might uh, end up as waste. Uh, and then if we can, uh, recycle these products back into um, basically a uh, starting product for the 3D printing. Again, we can sort of close this circle of, uh, uh, yeah, for our circular economy. Um, and this can, for example, be done um, with gas atomization. So gas atomization is typically used for the production of metal powders, uh, which are then used in metal 3D printing. However, currently this uh, gas atomization is a little bit of a, a black box so there's some um, parameter settings for gas atomizers that people know, well, this works. Uh, so they, they use that, but that's um, more or less where the knowledge of gas atomization uh, ends. Um, so let's have a look into the system that I'll, uh, I'm considering. So, uh, well, obviously from this, this session, we are considering uh, a multiphase system, which consists out of a superheated um, melt jet, which is very graphically or very systematic, uh, schematically shown in the picture. And that's impinged on by a supersonic gas jet, which will then uh, rupture it into, uh, well, first droplets and, and ligaments. So we first have an initial fragmentation that is the, the primary atomization, which I will be mainly focusing on uh, today. And there, of course, you can imagine since we have uh, a supersonic gas jet that uh, this goes paired with high turbulence, um, so that is very important to consider in this uh, part of the atomization. And then if we f move further downstream, um, this really starts to turn into a multi-scale problem. As you can see, these uh, droplets keep breaking up into finer and finer uh, sizes, and then we end up typically around uh, the order of 10 micrometer uh, droplets, which then also uh, start to solidify and turn into a, a fine powder. Um, so let's have a further look at uh, this primary atomization. Um, so the goal in, uh, in my research is to create a robust model of this whole atom uh, gas atomization. Um, and basically the main black box in this whole spray is the primary atomization. So as you can see from this uh, experimental picture, this is uh, a very complex breakup flow. Um, you can see the, the gas flow uh, in the background. Um, and basically not much is understood about what process parameters do to influence uh, this primary atomization. Um, and the goal of our model is to sort of gain an understanding of which process parameters have a significant impact on the breakup behavior so that we can finally relate that uh, to the powder properties that we uh, are obtaining. And mainly um, when viewing this from an additive manufacturing uh, point of view, we are interested in uh, the particle size distribution and getting that as close to monodisperse as we possibly can. Um, so let's move on to how we are going to model this. Um, so in the primary atomization modeling, I will uh, basically combine two techniques that are important to uh, get insight into this, uh, this process. So of course, we first want a sharp surface uh, representation for which I will be using a volume of fluid method. Um, and specifically in open foam, I will be using the compressible inter-isofoam uh, solver. 
Um, and then, as I said, uh, also turbulence plays a large role in uh, this type of system. So as you can see from this picture, which I took from literature, you can see here the uh, gas jets basically entering the system. And then you see these turbulent structures that move downwards. And they uh, seem to have uh, quite an impact on also the, the breakup behavior of uh, the liquid metal. Um, so we are uh, very interested in the local flow behavior. And that's why I will uh, attempt to uh, apply LES to this uh, type of system. Um, so as I said, the main topic of my, uh, my presentation is the considerations that I've uh, had so far to create a suitable mesh for this primary atomization. Um, the reason that I want to uh, elaborate on this is that in uh, literature that I've uh, encountered, this is sort of skipped over uh, relatively fast usually. So people present, well, we have this sort of mesh, this amount of cells. Uh, but there's never really um, a deep um, uh, information on how uh, is this mesh able to resolve both the, the LES and the, the VOF uh, length scales that we are interested in. Um, so, well, uh, talking about these length scales, so there are several length scales that we uh, would like to consider, uh, of course, in this system. Uh, first of all, the domain size, which as you can see here, it's about 20 millimeters in, in radius uh, for what I'm considering. Then we have the turbulent length scales uh, in the LES that are important to resolve. Um, and then finally, the droplet diameter in the volume of fluid method to, uh, to gain a, yeah, a sufficient resolution of all these droplets in the, the breakup. And these have, will all have to be represented in a single mesh uh, somehow. So here you can see the outline of my mesh, where here in the top right you see uh, the gas inlet uh, slit. Then here is the, the melt tube, and this is the protrusion of the uh, melt nozzle. Um, and the rest of this uh, top side is uh, modeled as a wall. Uh, and then the flow will, of course, go downwards uh, as the atomization uh, goes on. Um, so let's start with uh, the grid requirements for proper LES. So, uh, of course, um, there are some standard uh, requirements that LES needs to uh, confirm to. Uh, so first of all, it need, we need to be able to uh, resolve the integral length scale of the, the turbulence, which means that uh, basically locally we need to be able to represent the uh, average size of the turbulent kinetic uh, eddies. Uh, and we can uh, calculate this integral length scale from the turbulent kinetic energy and its uh, dissipation rate. Um, and then moving on from that, we can uh, check whether we indeed resolve enough of the turbulent kinetic energy. Um, and the typical criterion that's used there is uh, that uh, more than 80% of the total turbulent kinetic energy should be resolved uh, by the mesh in order to perform proper LES. Um, so on the, in the picture, you see uh, a snapshot uh, of my uh, initial mesh, uh, just to give you an idea of um, yeah, what sort of cell sizes I am uh, considering initially. Um, so then we move on to see if this will actually uh, be good enough to, to uh, resolve this, this flow in enough detail to perform LES. So in order to do that, I started with run simulations uh, of the system. So considering only uh, gas flow, leaving out the uh, liquid metal for now. Um, and then we see this uh, kind of division in the system between where we will have um, yeah, high flow velocities. So of course you would expect uh, high flow velocities near the uh, inlet of the, the pressurized gas. And then uh, moving downwards in the actual uh, direction, you see that this high velocity uh, field is quite concentrated towards the center of the atomizer. And on the other hand, on the left side, uh, you see that, well, in comparison, very little is happening. Uh, so we will also expect, of course, to see that split in the integral length scale of the turbulence. Um, so when we look at the uh, resolution of the integral length scale uh, of this grid, we can indeed see that. So um, we uh, see that on the left side, this integral length scale is, is quite well resolved, but close to the uh, gas inlet uh, and then moving downstream, there might still be some issues uh, with the resolution of the uh, turbulent kinetic energy. Um, so a typically uh, used criterion is that uh, this integral length scale should locally be uh, resolved with at least five cells uh, in the mesh. Um, so when we apply that criterion to this, uh, this first mesh, we can see that indeed, as we expected, 
in a large part of the domain, this, uh, this criterion is met. However, uh, close to the nozzle and at the walls, we do not meet this criterion yet, so we will have to uh, resolve further. Um, and from this, we can also derive a sort of a, a minimum cell size uh, for the LES that we need, which is, of course, what we we're looking for, and that uh, ends up around uh, 20 micron. So now we can consider the, the VOF, and uh, for the VOF, the requirement of the, the mesh size is actually quite straightforward, because, of course, when we look at a, a typical um, droplet size distribution after primary atomization, we want to uh, make our mesh such that we can still resolve the smallest droplets that we expect to encounter in a sufficient manner. Um, and as you can see, these droplets are already quite small, uh, even only after primary atomization. Uh, and this uh, kind of tells us that we will need a minimum cell size of about uh, 10 micrometers, which is quite small. And actually, it is so small that if we were to use a, a uniform grid to model this whole system, we would end up using um, more or less like 50 billion cells, which is um, not what we want at all, uh, because we, of course we want to, to be able to perform several uh, simulations to kind of get a, a taste of what the, the process parameters uh, can do in terms of influence on the, uh, the droplet size distribution. So we need to tackle this uh, in some ways. So first of all, for the LES, I will use a non-uniform grid where I choose to locally uh, resolve this uh, integral length scale. So that means that, uh, especially close to the nozzle, there will be some uh, local refinements that make sure that uh, everywhere in the grid we resolve this uh, turbulent length scale. Uh, and then for the VOF, uh, finally, we will um, use adaptive mesh refinement so that we only need this high resolution uh, close to the uh, or the gas melt interface. Um, however, of course, this uh, adaptive mesh refinement also comes with additional computational costs in terms of remeshing every so many time steps. So there we will need to find a compromise uh, in terms of how often will we remesh um, in order to keep this uh, the simulation uh, handleable in terms of computational uh, time. So that is uh, the strategy with regard to the mesh uh, for now. And so I would like to, for now, leave that behind and move on to um, the collection of data, which is the other part that's, of course, very important if we want to be able to, uh, in terms of statistics, say something about uh, the influence of process parameters on this, uh, this breakup. Um, so what we mainly want to do here is to capture the droplets in the VOF uh, field so that we can analyze them in terms of, well, first of all, the number of droplets, and then uh, per droplets, uh, certain properties such as, uh, as the volume, the diameter, um, their shape, um, but also velocity, location, and temperature, uh, so that we can use that to also proceed to the secondary breakup modeling later. Um, and of course, we want to capture these properties at a given location in the domain. So um, how do we do that? Uh, basically, we can consider these pictures on the right. So we have uh, our volume fraction field from the VOF, and we define a certain plane uh, at a given location in the mesh. And then we want to capture uh, all these properties of this droplet that's passing downwards through this plane. So we basically need to connect all these um, cells that have a volume fracture that's larger than zero. And if all these if two cells that are, have a volume fraction belonging to a droplet uh, are next to each other, then we consider them to belong to the same droplet and we can add up, for example, the volumes um, so that we can get to the final droplet volume. And then, of course, we also need, we don't need, only need to connect these cells in terms, uh, in, uh, in space, but we also need to uh, connect them in time. Uh, so once this first layer has been collected, the next time step, uh, this plane will see a next uh, layer, basically, of, uh, of our droplet, and then these volumes will still need to, uh, to be added to the same droplet so that we can um, consistently capture all of these, this information. Um, so this uh, functionality is uh, present in OpenFOAM. It's called uh, Extract Eulerian Particles. However, uh, I found that this uh, function, as it is implemented in uh, OpenFOAM, version 2106 uh, does not perform very well in terms of uh, the connectivity of these, uh, these cells in uh, time and space. So the capturing is done, but it uh, cannot connect all the cells uh, properly in time and space. 
Um, so a modified version of this function is available uh, online. It's made by uh, Spitzenberger. Um, so I'm using that uh, currently to uh, capture the droplets. Um, so basically what you see here in this, uh, this image uh, or in the video is a simple test that I performed for their uh, code where I just shoot a, an array of different uh, droplets on different in terms of uh, the amount of cells per uh, diameter of the droplet uh, and I capture them in the plane. Uh, and then you see here that uh, typically this, uh, uh, the volume of the droplets is uh, very well uh, captured except in the limit of um, yeah, very low resolution of the droplets. So we will typically need more or less uh, six uh, cells uh, on, through the diameter of a droplet in order to uh, capture its volume properly. Um, however, uh, so this, this looks nice. Uh, however, there's still a few issues to be resolved um, in, in this code. The first one is that if the, the plane in which I'm capturing these uh, droplet information um, is at the same location uh, as a, a processor boundary in parallel uh, computation, then it will somehow still crash. Uh, so I'm uh, currently trying to find out uh, where this goes wrong and how I can fix it. Um, and then secondly, the combination of this capturing technique with uh, adaptive mesh refinement uh, is also a challenge. Uh, and that's in the first place uh, has to do with the fact that uh, this uh, capturing function once it um, has detected that a droplet has completely passed the plane, it uh, stores it in a uh, Lagrangian cloud. But this Lagrangian cloud is then, of course, not used anymore in the simulation, so the positions aren't updated, and the adaptive mesh refinement is, is not very happy with that. Uh, so it will need to um, store these, this information in a, in a different way. Um, and of course, I will also have to check whether um, the connectivity of the cells uh, uh, for capturing the, the volume uh, is consistent still when we are uh, remeshing uh, at some point. Um, so with that, I would like to go to the, the outlook of my, uh, my work. So for the LES, we, uh, I can say that we are basically nearly there in terms of resolving this uh, turbulent kinetic energy, but we will still have to validate whether this 80% uh, resolution criterion is, is locally met everywhere in our mesh. Um, for the VOF, I'm currently um, Im implementing the adaptive mesh refinement and sort of figuring out this balance between um, remeshing uh, and, uh, and the computational time that it, it takes. Um, as, and as I just mentioned, uh, the droplet capturing uh, has some issues to be resolved before we can properly use it to gather uh, information on our spray. Um, and then when these two are uh, yeah, sort of solved and ready to go, we can combine them into our primary atomization study uh, and do a detailed study of the, the breakup process where we can take into account the influence of the local turbulence on the breakup of the spray um, and then finally relate the process uh, parameters of the atomization to the diameter distribution that we obtain uh, from the spray. And so finally, I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisors at the university. So Julia Finitello, uh, Niels Dane, and uh, Joris Ramis uh, are supervising me in my work. Um, and with that, I've come to the end of my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. So let's start with the questions inside the amphitheater, yeah? Um, thanks for the um, nice presentation. I was wondering, with your droplet atomization and droplet um, distributions, do you have also numerical diffusion so that small droplets quickly diffuse into uh, larger droplets, or don't you observe those? Um, that is indeed a worry that we have, um, but I'm not at the point yet where I've been able to, uh, to study that uh, in detail. Uh, so in principle, I hope that with this adaptive mesh refinement, we will be able to uh, keep a sharp uh, surface, even for the small droplets. Um, but yeah, that's something that remains to be seen. Yeah, to complete about, dust, about that, if you want to minimize maybe the dissipation, I mean, the, the smearing of the droplets, I mean, small droplets, 
maybe you should use some geometrical uh, formulation of the B-wave methods. So the iso vector solvers, for instance. Yeah. Thank you. I was wondering about the LES part, LES part. Do you put anything in the inlet for the gas phase, like turbulent BFSM or any white noise? Um, so we're, I'm planning to do that, yeah. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm, I don't have it uh, implemented. But uh, one of the things that I want to um, investigate is indeed also the influence of the turbulence, turbulent intensity of um, not only the gas flow, but also the melt flow um, on the breakup, because I can imagine that that has a significant influence on uh, the breakup process. We'll go and check if I have questions on the chat there. Uh, no. Any other question in the attendance? Yes. Yes, uh, in terms of your uh, reducing your number of cells, what's your objective? How low do you want to go? And um, what HPC architecture do you have in mind to run this? Um, yeah, so currently, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that, so thank you for the question. Um, currently, I'm uh, with the LES grid that I presented. Um, I'm sort of facing around 8 million cells already. Um, so as I, yeah, and as I said, if we would resolve uh, this, this small scale for the VOF completely, we would go to 50 billion cells. Uh, so pref preferably, I would like to stay below 20 million cells, I think. Um, and we are still looking, uh, so currently we're running this on the high performance cluster of the Antov University. Uh, but we're also looking to go to uh, the Surf Sahara uh, performance uh, cluster. Um, which is located in Amsterdam, so that we have a bit more computational power uh, in those terms. Well, you could reduce the, uh, this, uh, the angular sector of your computation. Yeah, of course, that's also uh, <laughs> a pretty straightforward way of doing it, yeah. but then, of course, <laughs> we should um, determine uh, where this trade-off is between uh, how far or how far we can cut it before the symmetrical boundary conditions start having influence on the, the spray itself. Any other questions? Okay, so if there is no more question, I would like to thank you. So next speaker is, uh, sorry, Hello. Hello. okay, uh, from University of Minho, right? right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, as Lionel said, my name is Sergio Fernandez, and I came from the University of Minho in Portugal, and I will present to you the, the working title, Free Surface Flows of Polymer Melts, under non-isothermal conditions. So this work was performed uh, in collaboration with my colleague Hamad Fakari from the University of Porto, also in Portugal, and Professor Zelko Tukovic from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. The table of contents for this presentation is the following. First, I will give to you and introduce the motivation to perform this work. Then I will explain the governing equations which are needed to model our process. Then I will present some results about uh, these uh, governing equations so we can validate and verify the solver. And finally, we will address the conclusions. For the motivation, we need to think about the our uh, polymer department in the university where we usually use uh, several uh, machines 
as the extrusion machine or injection molding machine to produce parts from the polymers. And usually uh, we need to test first with several polymers, uh, several operating conditions. And what happens is that sometimes the flow is balanced, but mostly of the times the flow is unbalanced and we need to fix the problem by trial and error. So what we would like to, to have is to try to simulate the extrusion process uh, through a numerical simulation code. For that, our code should be able to handle free surface flows because material comes from a confined flow to the exterior. And we will get a boundary stress singularity that is present at the die. Also, what happened is that we need to study this polymer production under non-isothermal conditions because uh, the extrusion die usually is hot. So we need to account for the transfer phenomenon in our algorithm. Some previous works were developed already in open form, and the first one was in 2012 from Zelko Tukovic and Jazak, which firstly present a moving mesh interface tracking method and that is able to simulate incompressible, isothermal, and emissible two phase interfacial fluid flows. Um, in 2021, uh, with the collaboration of my colleague Ahmad Fakari, we have improved this numerical algorithm with uh, interface tracking that, uh, method which employs the least square volume to point interpolation method for degrees movement and a consistent second order time accurate piezo numerical procedure which we studied on this paper that is able to efficiently simulate the extrudate swell phenomenon. We found that with this consistent option, our, uh, um, our time step reduces uh, circa of 30%. So the objectives for this work are the following. First, we want to develop now a non-isothermal two-phase interface interface tracking algorithm. And after that, we would like to verify the ability of this code to predict uh, the flow characteristics in the extra day swell of generalized Newtonian fluids. Not only a Newtonian fluid, but also an inelastic fluid. So the mathematical model consists of the mass conservation equation, the linear momentum conservation equation, and here we need to add this surface velocity, which will handle the deformation of the mesh. Here we have also the divergence of the stress. And also we need to account for the temperature effects through the energy equation, where we need to give to the code two parameters, which are the heat capacity and also the thermal conductivity of the material and also we take into account the viscous dissipation. For the mesh movement, we need to solve the space conservation equation where we need to solve for the surface velocity, as I explained before. And for the polymeric geological characterization, we will use the generalized Newtonian model, which is simply given by the product between the viscosity and the strain stress tensor. D. For the calculation of the viscosity, we will employ the Ashley Buckley model with a Papanastasio regularization, which handles the discontinuity of the viscosity at the L stress value tau zero. For this model, we need also to give uh, two parameters, which are M, which is responsible for the stress growth and also N, which is the index exponent, which is responsible 
for the shear thinning or shear thickening behavior, depending if it is greater or lesser than one. For the temperature dependence, we consider that the uh, consistency viscosity K is dependent on temperature, and we employed the superposition uh, methods to say that this K can be written as the product of a consistent viscosity at a reference temperature that we call K0 times the shift factor. And the shift factor is computed by the William Lander Ferry relation, which depends on two material parameters, C1 and C2. Then, to close the, the mathematical formulation, we need to have boundary conditions at the free surface, which are the kinematic condition that is responsible by the continuity of the velocity in both phases, and also the dynamic condition, which states that the difference between the stresses of the two phases needs to be equal to the difference between the surface gradient of the surface tension and the term uh, which accounts for the uh, curvature of the interface. Finally, for the temperature, we need to consider a natural convection between the material and the air, and that is given by this expression where we need to have the heat transfer coefficient, which usually is measured ex experimentally, and we need to give the ambient temperature and the thermal conductivity of the polymer. So setting the mathematical model, we need to discretize it and implement in open form, and for that we use a numerical integration in time that is second order accurate and implicit. We need to discretize the fluid equations in space and uh, we use the second order accurate cell centered unstructured finite volume method, which is in open form. And we uh, need to use the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian formulation with the consistent piezo algorithm for, to calculate the velocity at the free surface. And finally, the mesh deformation is calculated using the Laplacian mesh equation with variable diffusivity. After we have implemented the numerical algorithm, we went to verify our code, and we have done the verification with a axisymmetric extrusion die, where we define the two back and uh, front patches as wedge patches with a five degrees angle. We have a die which here with a wall, which will be considered a wall, so no slip boundary conditions for velocity and temperature. We consider the inlet with an average fluid velocity U. We consider the outlet with zero pressure and zero gradient velocity. And what we intend to measure is the extrudate swell ratio, which will be given by the ratio between the final height of the material, H0, divided by the initial height of the die. Here we show a discretization of the mesh and what is important to consider is that we need to have a gradient near the wall so that we can uh, accurately capture this, uh, this height H0 at steady state. The dimensionless numbers which are important for this flow are the Reynolds number, which is the ratio between uh, viscous and uh, inertia effects, the Bingham number, which is the ratio between the stress and viscous effects, and the Prandtl number for the ratio between moment diffusivity and thermal diffusivity. So we will vary both of the uh, three dimensional numbers to verify against literature results how our results are accurate or not. First, we study the effects of inertia and the yield stress in the extra swell of Bingham fluids. Here 
we consider well, we, for a big M fluid, n is equal to 1, the index exponent, and we consider the effect of inertia changing the Reynolds number from 1, 5, and 10, and the Bingham number was changing from 10 power minus 4 to 10 power 1, which will give the effect of the yield stress. Our results are computed for all these conditions and compared by the results from Conturiotis in 2014. And as you can see, our results represent by symbols match perfectly the results represent by solid lines from Conturiotis. It is important to notice that when we increase the inertia, we see that we do not have any more this monotonic behavior of the extra rate swell ratio, but we start to having a peak with the maximum in the extra rate swell ratio, and then the, the extra rate swell ratio decreases. So here we also present the contour plots of the velocity magnitude and the stress magnitude. And as you can see, for low effect of the yield stress, so Bingham 0.001, we have a parabolic velocity profile. And for uh, the increase of the yield stress, what happens is that the velocity profile changes from a parabolic profile to a plug flow profile. And this is responsible for the decrease of the extra rate swell ratio height. And this is accompanied by a decrease on the polymeric stress magnitude here on the stress singularity point, which is three times harder, lower than the uh, lowest yield stress case. Next, we uh, simulate an uh, Ashley-Buckley fluid where we change n, the n value from 0 0.5 and 1.5 this is responsible for shear thinning fluids, and this one is for shear thickening fluids. And we plot again the results for several Reynolds numbers and Bingham numbers, and the results are pretty much similar from the other case. But what is important to notice is that shear thinning behavior will decrease the extra rate swell ratio, but shear thickening behavior will increase the extra rate swell ratio, comparing with the reference case with n equals 1. Again, we can show the contour plots for the velocity magnitude and for the stress magnitude. And what happens, and as expected, is that here in the shear thinning fluid, the velocity, maximum velocity increases, which reduces the extra rate swell ratio because the flow is faster and uh, the stress also decreases here. And for the case of the shear thickening fluid, the, the velocity here uh, increases also much more and the stress also increases. But to summarize these results, our code is stable for all the conditions tested uh, with this different uh, inertia Bingham, and uh, type of fluid. Finally, the objective of this work was to perform non-isothermal simulations, and we consider two different cases, which is first the case where the temperature at the die wall is lesser than the temperature at the inlet. So this means that the fluid will be cooled down uh, in the die and also another case where the temperature at the die wall will be greater than the temperature at the inlet, which means that we will hot the material. So uh, we fix here n equals 1 and Reynolds equals 10, and what happens is that when the material is cool, we see that the extra rate swell ratio decreases, but that does not happen when the material is hot, we see an increase on the extra rate swell ratio, which then starts to decrease after a uh, yield, uh, some yield stress value. So this is important to understand 
for which kind of conditions we are imposing if we will uh, get a contraction of the material or if we'll get an expansion. So, because this we, with this we can control what will happen in the real world in the extrusion machine. We can also present here the velocity magnitude contours and also the, for the two Bingham numbers and for the two setups of the temperature. And also we present the temperature profiles for the different cases where you can see here that the, the material is being cooled down with the uh, blue color for the temperature and here where the material is being hot inside the extrusion die. So in conclusion, we have developed a numerical algorithm which is able now to solve non-isothermal and inelastic non-Newtonian free surface flows and the algorithm is based on the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian formulation. This uh, developed algorithm was assessed in terms of accuracy for the isothermal calculations in the axisymmetric extruded swell of Bingham fluids and Ashley Buckley fluids, and also for the case of the non isothermal flow of the axisymmetric extruded swell using the Bingham fluid at Reynolds 10. My acknowledgement goes to FCT, the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, which found this work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Any question in the attendance? Yeah, two questions. Thank you, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering at the moment, is your nozzle, um, w when you actually extrude through the nozzle, have you thought about any changes in the geometry um, and how the temperature would change based on the exit geometry of the nozzles? So if I correctly understood your question, you are saying if I modify anything on the geometry uh, when the temperature changes, It looked from your geometry, um, you just had a very sharp sort of exit. Uh, I was wondering if there's any changes in the geometry of the nozzle, how that sort of affects um, the uh, the temperature change the contours. So from, you are from the die here on yeah. this zone. Yeah, if there's any, if you if you've thought about looking into changing how the um, how the die is shaped, basically. How the die changes. Uh, yeah, the die is not changing. The die is this is always fixed. This region of the geometry is always fixed. So what changes is after the polymer goes out of the die, you will see this extrudate swell. So this starts changing due to the mesh deformation. So the here nothing will change on the die. Only after it. Yeah, I was so, saying if you change the angle of where the die is, does that change how? your free set. Oh, you? no. If I change the die angle, yeah. it's something will change. No, we did not yet you, study that. Yeah. Are you planning on doing that in the future? It was kind of where I was going. <laughs> Sorry? Are you planning on looking at that in the future or, um, with <laughs> at all? Or yeah, this work actually was already published. So, but it's open yet the work because we want also to extend for other kind of uh, materials, not only uh, generalized Newtonian, but also viscoelastic. But uh, for that, we need to to change how the boundary conditions are implemented in the free surface. Okay, because we will not have only the viscous effects, but also the elastic effects due to the polymeric stress. So we need to get uh, and derive a mathematical formulation for the boundary conditions here. And perhaps that is a good idea. Uh, when we uh, are able to simulate the viscoelastic flows, one of the case studies could be to change here the angle of the die and see what happens. Yeah, but this work is under progress. Uh, the problem is that my colleague, which uh, uh, I supervise, um, is now on another university. 
So I, I need to try to, <laughs> to get someone to work and restart this. So yeah, but awesome. yeah, I'm open to collaborations on this. Mm, awesome, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so your question was answered. So we have a question in the front. Am I assuming that the heat transfer function was just kept constant for all for all of these circumstances for so your study? The heat transfer, uh, the temperature here on the die is constant, right? Well, that's yes, I understand that's constant. But as it comes out, it got a free surface. You had oh. something about the com the obviously the, how that yeah the rest no. of it cools down. So did you keep that constant, or did you investigate changing it? The temperature at the free surface, uh, we need to impose here a boundary condition for temperature. Okay, so, and I explained here on this model yeah. that we impose the natural convection boundary condition there. Yes, I, under, I understand that. But you, so that has that term H. And you, assume, you assume that term was constant? H is constant, right. Okay, it's just you end up with a situation that it would change if you were using for instance, force, force ventilation to, to, to cool the polymer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we did not change it. Yeah. But that, yeah, it will <laughs> improve the complexity of the problem and it can be done in the future too. Yeah. But not, it, it was not done now. <laughs> so let me check if we have any questions. questions but I think this is not for this uh, have you validated the pressure field and how long the quenching of the particles will take so no I think this is a question for you before <laughs> so the question for is the for former, me I think it was a question for the former presenter okay. and uh, unfortunately I did not double check again the questions on the chat. So maybe okay. we finish with your presentation okay. and if we have any other question for Celio, then we can switch to the other question. No? No more question? Thank you, Celio Fernandez, for your you. nice presentation. Thank you. So yes, for the atomization presentation, <laughs> we had uh, two questions, in fact. One, have you validated the pressure field? Uh, so I have had a look at uh, the pressure field indeed. Um, so, but um, mostly with respect to my boundary conditions. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah not, not in a, a lot of detail uh, yet. So I've compared uh, quantitatively uh, qualitatively to what's seen in, in literature and that uh, sort of resembled uh, indeed but I haven't uh, done much more than that. And then there was this double question uh, how long does it, how long the quenching of the particle will take? Um, so that's because not really cooling uh, regarding the yeah cooling of the so particle. that's uh, not really of relevance to the primary atomization yet uh, but that's something that's typically considered when you look at the secondary atomization where mm. At some point, indeed, the um, solidification starts to compete also with the breakup of the, the droplets. Um, but I haven't considered that uh, at this point. Thank you. I think we have a last presenter that is or she is online. Right. OK. So today I will present Analysis of dropwise condensation process with the intercondensing evaporating foam and also with the LPT, Lagrangian particle tracking. Uh, so, this is an ongoing uh, work of Claudio Correa, PhD, supervised by Jose Aldiso. I'm helping uh, implementing this in uh, open foam. So, the idea is to simulate the, the upper part of the um, uh, of a uh, of this tower uh, with the with the comb. 
so the the goal is to study the process of condensation of water vapor uh, from the wet cooling of coke uh, with the um, with the with the dynamic uh, diffusion process. Uh, so this is an important um, head transfer mechanism and is applied to the column of the coke small swing tower. And um, we want to see also the, the wall condensation capacity and uh, we'll evaluate different geometries. So for this, we're using the intercondensating evaporating foam and also uh, Lagrangian particle targeting method with the one-way coupling. Uh, so we want to discuss the, um, the, the ability of open foam or of these models to predict the volume of condensated on the wall, the influence of the tower structures on the concentration process, and also the condensation coefficient that is not very um, easy to, to use. Uh, so this is an important process to be applied on many industrial areas. And um, um, I will start with the, with the process. Uh, so the physical mechanism of the occurrence of the vapor condensation can occur like a, like a film on the left or on the bubbles formation on the right. And um, to have this type of condensation uh, in both process, we have to, to have the temperature before the saturation temperature below. Okay, so um, normally the, um, the bubble concentration, um, we have a coefficient uh, that is much higher than, than the film. So this is the velocity profile uh, from uh, Momento equation uh, with, uh, with some uh, assumptions like neglecting the advective terms and assuming the liquid density equal in the vapor and in the liquid. So for mathema as mathematical models, we have the Eulerian model. Uh, so continuity, Momento equation, energy, uh, volume of fluid, uh, and also k omega model. And um, the um, evaporation condensation foam um, use the Lee model for phase change. We also use the Lagrangian model, like uh, the, the force, the velocity, the stroll, and the drive force. Uh, so why use intercondensating evaporating foam? Uh, so uh, because it's two incompressible emission non isothermal fluids with phase change and uh, between fluids and its vapor. And uh, we, we have to use the Wolf method to capture the interface. Uh, we also use Lagrangian particle tracking uh, to have an idea uh, and to um, uh, follow the particles. So it was also a turbulent flow. So the Coke small swing tower is more or less like this, like this um, but we are using just the, the upper part and uh, we have a mesh and we use like uh, uh, 64 centimeters by 90 and with the length with 2.8 meters. Uh, which is a cross-sectional area of uh, 50, uh, 0 0.58 squ square meters, producing a, a flow uh, for the vapor or the steam, and uh, with a mass flow uh, of 0 0.05 kilograms per second. For initial condition, uh, we use this. We have an inlet uh, on the bottom, an outlet on the upper part, and then uh, walls. And we study a mesh, um, a different meshes. And uh, we notice that there is some instability uh, in the end. Uh, so we stop the model uh, about 10 seconds for not having so much uh, instability. But we have to improve that. Um, so these are uh, a dimension, non dimensional velocity, non dimensional uh, time. And um, 
uh, we have uh, some difference, but uh, the all in the majority time of the simulation, we don't have uh, many um, uh, many deviation of the three mesh, so the model is consistent, and we use the the mesh number two. About the empirical condensation coefficient, um, Saniel um, suggests that uh, this coefficient has to be empirical adjust uh, to maintain the temperature close to the saturation temperature. So uh, we analyze the coefficient that is um, calculated with the, within the model. And uh, we, sh we see that the, the coefficient is decreasing until the end to, to, to maintain uh, that, to fulfill that um, condition. So these are the results until eight seconds for temperature. So we have the, the vapor here and then starts to, on the wall, uh, to, uh, inc increase in the in the time and on the 10 seconds uh, uh, reach more or less uh, here. For the the um, LPT model, we also we can uh, follow the particles and we see that near the um, the walls we have uh, here a higher velocity. So comparing the the temperature with the liquid fraction. We have a height correlation of both. <laughs> and um, we analyze that we have the, um, the co condition coefficient uh, uh, in the order of uh, one divided by one other uh, value. So we have here the velocity and the um, uh, with the, this coefficient that is uh, low, uh, we we need more time to have the simulation, and we are working on on that. Then we compare the the geometry of the the volume, and the, we have here the square, like like I, I show, and this is the cylindrical. And we notice that in the cylindrical, we have uh, on uh, 10 seconds much more um, a velocity and uh, more uh, a circulation. And analyzing the coefficient, we have different uh, patterns. So this is the L, and the, along the, the length of the, um, the domain, we have uh, different uh, parts of of the, um, the prismatic and the cylindrical uh, um, domain values of the, the coefficient. And also uh, here the alpha is different, like we notice here, uh, it's, it's very um, different and uh, we are analyzing that. Uh, so, um, as conclusion, uh, we noticed that is very unstable and we have to use uh, low coefficient of the condensation um, coefficient to have to stabilize the temperature gradient and to have um, stabilization of the, the simulation. Uh, the Lagrangian uh, performed uh, well with one way coupling and we can uh, look at the the vapor uh, leaded by particles and with a high correlation of the um, uh, the alpha so uh, for now we are um, working on this uh, condensation coefficient uh, to attain more time of the simulation and uh, to, to analyze uh, better was why this occurs. Okay, we have some uh, reference and uh, thank you. <laughs>